Prince Albert's family was not what you would expect. They were crazy. He was born a noble at birth, but his childhood was not a fairy tale. It was more of a horror movie. His mother, Princess Louise, married his father, who was nearly twice her age. He was the Duke of saxe coburg in Gotha. It is not surprising with such an age gap that the relationship began to fall apart, especially because his father was a serial cheater. Please continue to support my channel by subscribing. His mother was left heartbroken by her husband's sexual antics, but rather than hide away and wallow, she fought back. She sought her own long list of lovers in retaliation. And she didn't hide her affairs away. She often flaunted them right in front of Albert and Ernest, his brother. It was this unhealthy and toxic environment that left Albert emotionally damaged, but there was worse to come. His home life was infamous and it wasn't long until his parents' split came around in 1826, after less than a decade of marriage. There were rumours swirling before their split that his mother was being unfaithful in the relationship, and she was. But it was evident when she went on to marry her last lover, Alexander von Hanstein, only seven months later. Albert was to feel the full force of this betrayal when his mother abandoned him. But this was not by choice. This scandal brought the end of her attendance at court, and she was banished from taking part, as well as seeing her sons again. The toxic couple's scandals were not over, and his father went on to marry his own niece, who was also Albert's cousin, Duchess Marie. Perhaps this is why he had so many emotional issues in the years to come. Albert did not want to repeat history, and his father wasn't a role model he wanted to follow, and so he was determined to be a bigger and better man. He wanted to be perfect at everything, so he threw himself into his studies at the University of Bonn, as well as taking part in fencing, which he was also very talented at. He was also under training to become the best suitor in Prince Charming for the new Queen of England, a role his family was hoping he would fit into his whole life. His family played matchmaker, as was often the case back in the day. Albert had already met the Queen, but she found him unflattering and a bit podgy. But at a now 17-year-old strapping man, his family started seriously trying to mould him into the perfect match for the future Queen of England. Looking back now, this match was a bit concerting because she was his first cousin. This was not uncommon at the time, although the tradition was running thin among commoners due to the advancements in medical information that showed that close family matches could lead to birth defects in their offspring. The royal family circles hardly differed at all, even their midwives when they were born was the same. The wedding was basically cemented in history from birth, his grandmother had been planning the wedding since Albert was just two years old. This was a lot of pressure for one boy to take on his shoulders, and although the families had a low-level agreement that the pair would go on to marry, there was still hefty competition for the English crown, from many other suitors, as Victoria was the most eligible bride of the times. With his uncle in tow, young Albert visited England to meet his future wife, a mother of his children. She was the most eligible bride of the times, and she was not going unnoticed on the European marriage market. A long line of eligible bachelors were already lining up to court her. But he had one thing in his favour. Now that he had matured, he had grown up to become very handsome, and it did not go unnoticed by Victoria. The other main suitor of Victoria was Prince Alexander of Orange. He was a very eligible suitor who had a shared interest in horses and adventuring. But Victoria described him as very plain, and so the spark was perhaps not there. This was very different to her description of Albert, 
who she described as being extremely handsome, praising his very sweet mouth and fine teeth, and the delightful expression in his eyes. It was this royal visit that cemented their futures as husband and wife. He had stolen her heart, and she had stolen his. But their life was not going to run smoothly. Despite the successful meeting, Albert returned home a single bachelor, and there were no proposals on the cards. It had been a year since their initial courtship, when Victoria became the Queen of England. The love had perhaps fizzled out slightly, and Victoria was uninterested in marrying immediately, as she did not want to bow to the pressure of her family to put a ring on her finger. She wanted to settle into her new role as head of state. Maybe she was just getting cold feet as she was still very young. Rumours began to swell that Victoria was to be betrothed to Albert, and they were not happy about it, and neither was the government. He had a reputation of coming from a backward country with a scandalous court, and so they were not overly keen on him getting his hands on the throne alongside their queen. After nearly pushing Albert away with her hot and cold behaviour, she soon stuck to her decision to be with Albert, and she proved it to him in the most unconventional of ways by proposing to him. This was not common behaviour, and it still isn't for the woman to propose to the man. And in October of 1839, Victoria proposed to her future husband, breaking all traditions. This was to represent the power dynamics of their relationship in the years to come. Albert accepted her proposal, but this turned out to be a bad omen for their future. Their royal wedding was like something from a fairy tale with a perfect show of opulent wealth and power. In February 1840, the young couple married in the idyllic chapel royale at St James's Palace. Queen Victoria wore a white wedding dress which started the fashion for weddings for years to come. The wedding day was enjoyable and light, but his wedding night was very racy. Victoria wrote about their wedding night in her memoirs, leaving no detail to the imagination. Her personal account went into her desire about finally being alone with Albert, and apparently the prince did not disappoint. She wrote in capital letters, I never, never spent such an evening, my dearest, dearest, dear Albert. He clasped me in his arms and we kissed each other again and again. Albert and Victoria were crazy about each other and they couldn't get enough of each other. But this led to Victoria experiencing the consequences of their many racy evenings together. When she became pregnant more times than she would have liked and much quicker than she had desired. Victoria wanted to spend a while as a newly married couple sitting on the throne and settling into their new life. But much to her dismay, only weeks after the wedding, the Queen discovered she was pregnant. She thought she had a few months to enjoy her new husband alone, and the pair were still only very young, with no idea how to raise a family. And then it got even more chilling. His queen threatened to put an end to her new infant if it was a girl especially. She was upset by her pregnancy, which is understanding for a young woman who wanted to live an independent lifestyle for a while. But her letters revealed a darker side to her thoughts when she wrote to her grandmother, complaining that the idea of a baby was spoiling her happiness. She also wrote that if she had the misfortune to give birth to a nasty girl, she would drown the babe. Albert perhaps did not understand his new wife's feelings on the matter, but it wasn't long before it came to light. Victoria and Albert had a brilliant sex life according to Victoria's memoirs, but their passion did not just burn in the bedroom. Their passion overflowed for each other, and also showed itself in other ways, with many fiery arguments where Victoria 
would then use her favourite weapon of silence, ignoring Albert and forcing him to communicate with her via notes under her door. Only there was something very sinister about all of this because his wife actually scared him. Albert had rumours about his life spread around, but Victoria also had her fair share of rumours that Albert had heard. He had heard that Victoria's grandfather had been Mad King George III and he was worried that her unhinged behaviour was a reflection that she had inherited this royal madness too. He should have been more concerned with the genetic issues that she was carrying instead, especially now that they were expecting a child together. His wife despised being a mother, even during the pregnancy stage, and she struggled to contain her dismay towards the prospect of being a mother. She absolutely hated being pregnant, and she spent most of the time miserable. She thought newborn infants were ugly and she was disgusted by breastfeeding her own children and others breastfeeding theirs too. This is something she would discourage her own children to do. And one of the reasons she may have hated pregnancy so much may have been because she suffered severely from postpartum depression, once calling pregnancy the heaviest trial I have ever had to endure. The prior concerns of royal madness came to fruition when she began to experience hallucinations, further linking her to Mad King George III. Albert's response to all of this was brutal. He was not the most supportive despite his wife bringing new life into the world and he could be very cruel about it. Victoria was obviously, as most women are, scared of childbirth and it was not the safest undertaking of a woman and the strain that it would put on her body. Albert was anything but empathetic. He was annoyed and impatient, and he complained about her moods and lack of self-control, sneering at her crying over a miserable trifle. Not only was their marriage and life under threat by the mental health of the pair, but they were also in physical danger when they suffered a near-fatal attack. The pair were still newly married. Victoria was pregnant and the pair were travelling by horse and carriage when out of nowhere the deranged Edward Oxford jumped out of the crowd with a loaded pistol and he shot at the royal couple with the intention of killing the Queen. The pair were unharmed despite the horses being dumbfounded and rearing off at speed. Their life would hit more turmoil in the months to come. The year they were hoping for didn't arrive when their eldest child was born a girl, the very thing Victoria disapproved of the most. She was named Princess Vicky and her birth was a far cry away from celebration. Even the doctor said mournfully, Oh, Madame is a girl. Victoria shot back, Never mind, next time it will be a prince. But Victoria and Albert would learn to be careful what they wished for when the children just kept coming. Luckily for the pair, an heir was born second, with Albert being the longed-for boy. They nicknamed him Bertie and he took on the full force of pressure from the family, with Albert particularly determined to mould him into the perfect man and he had high expectations on his son just as much as he had put this on himself as a young man. This led him to become a controlling father. This was unconventional at the time. The men usually took little interest in their offspring, but this was the opposite for Albert. He was always keen to have a huge influence in his children's life, and he developed a rigorous educational curriculum for them. Albert overcorrected the children and he was overly picky by expecting perfection and the results were not pretty. Join me in part two to learn what happened next when Albert took to corporal punishment through caning his son when he didn't perform well. Please continue to support my channel by subscribing. Please comment, like and subscribe if you wish for more stories and leave your suggestions below and I will endeavour to cover them.